It's very good to see you, David. Hi, good afternoon, Stephen. And I see that you're, you looks like you're in your office, your lovely courtyard or house office uh, in uh, just off Tiananmen Square. I've been to your <laughs> office several times and I've always thought what a wonderful, wonderful office it is to work in. What a, what a calm and serene environment to work in. So you're very, very lucky uh, to work in an office like that. Yeah, thank you for saying so, Stephen. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure to participate in today's discussion. And I'm in Beijing, and I know you are in Singapore. And uh, my firm is located in uh, yeah, Beijing, but very close to Forbidden City, and in uh, Beijing Sihuayuan, and um, part of which was um, uh, the region's residence in Qing Dynasty. And um, the Tiantong Law Firm is a litigation-owning law firm, as you know, Stephen. And we have uh, uh, more than uh, 200 attorneys uh, with a uh, focus on commercial disputes. Uh, in Beijing office, which is our headquarter, but also cross country with other seven offices. And Be uh, Tiantong, as you know, was established in 2002. And uh, we, you know, since establishment, a lot of them were still in a keep going with a uh, focus on commercial dispute resolution, litigation, arbitration, enforcement, and restructuring. And I'm lucky to, you know, have this office, uh, which is, you know, looks like a, a very Asian with history here in Beijing and well fit into the surroundings of the, uh, the Forbidden City and Tiananmen Square. Yeah, and it's so calm and peaceful in your office. I think it's, it's fantastic that you have that kind of office environment. And as, as a disputes lawyer as well, I think when you're preparing for your cases, it's so important to have a calm, quiet environment so that you can think, reflect, uh, and uh, when I've been to your office, I've been to your office twice, I think, and that's the exact feeling I get in when I walk inside, you know, your, your courtyard, you say, in, in Mandarin, the Shihayan, the courtyard house, it's just such an amazing experience. And, and you know, uh, I can see as you, know, you are in your office and you can, you can see I'm at home because we're still in lockdown in Singapore and, and you've obviously been through that experience uh, and life is now returning to to normal, some, somewhat, I believe, in Beijing. But you know, tell me about some of the uh, lessons that you might have learned uh, through the period of lockdown that you've had. You know, how did that change your practice and, and what changes that you adapted to during the lockdown that you see, you foresee carrying through forward even outside the lockdown? There must have been quite a few changes that, that you experienced and which you think would probably make your practice more experienced. So tell me a bit about that. Yes, uh, indeed, uh, Stephen. You know, the China was first uh, uh, hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, unfortunately. And uh, after the Chinese New Year holidays, uh, this holiday was extended for a bit more days. And then, you know, the uh, gradually including legal practice and other practices, you know, uh, was getting back to normal. Um, but uh, for one or two months, I think February and March, we still were asked to, you know, work from home including Tianhong lawyers and all the Beijing lawyers. Um, and and what are we going to do? Uh, basically, we still try to keep alive um, and keep interacting with uh, different, uh, you know, you know uh, with clients, with the judges, and follow the procedures, um, and, uh, you know, give phone calls to uh, the law clerks, to the uh, case managers as uh, arbitration institutions, and we just to try to you know keep communication going, and on the other hand, uh, we indeed you know, observed you know some uh, slowing down of the you know the, the court procedures and arbitration procedures. But luckily, I think the uh, back in in China, we particularly in Beijing area, Beijing courts and some you know the very leading Chinese arbitration institutions like CTEC and the Beijing Arbitration Commission. But well, the, the working staff and the leaders, they're very conscious about the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And they uh, made a lot of good efforts to uh, try to mitigate the effects. Uh, for example, the uh, Beijing court system, you know, uh, they put forward an online, you know, hearing system. So the, uh, you know, the, the litigants and their uh, counsel could look into that system and uh, you know, upload the uh, electronic files, and there are some transition transcription you know services also available in support of the uh, virtual hearings. 
you know, uh, occurring before the court, Beijing court, and those Chinese leading arbitration institutions. So, uh, so I think the two lessons we have, one is we still want to, you know, keep our service going. And so that's we try every means, you know, particularly electronic um, in communication with clients and the different people, judges, arbitrators. And on the other hand, you know, we try to explore new technologies like, you know, the uh, online virtual hearing system to you know, maintain um, the, uh, the hearings available and try to mitigate the uh, effects of the pandemic. Tell me more about the online uh, hearing system that you used in China. I mean, this is a phenomenon that we are seeing as well uh, with international arbitration. Many parties are using Zoom, Jeans, and other platforms like that. What sort of platform were you using in China? Yes. Um, you know, uh, China in past a few years, um, particularly online industries and uh, business related to the internet industry were booming. And you, you find it the WeChat payment and the, the Alibaba payment, all these online payments are really advanced for a period of time. And this is kind of advantages uh, in the internet industry in China uh, carries weight to is a, is a legal practice now. So basically, it's a, for example, Beijing court system, they already developed an independent aligned hearing system, uh, make you know, the parties and the council available to participate in the hearings um, based on very stable technologies. Uh, for example, they could send you a text message to your mobile phone, and there is a link in that text message, and also a case number. So you click on that uh, web link, and you your the web page would direct you to um, you know online system, and then you get your username and password registered, and you can access to the online uh, system. And on the uh, hearing date, you log in and you find you know the uh, the web page would ask you to download you know you know the certain applications. Then you can. Would will be uh, directed to the online hearing room, just like you know today, you and I can you know uh, you know see each other through this uh, Zoom you know platform. The participant and the council can also see each other very clearly and hear each other very clearly, and also the hearing room and um, usually you know the judges there and with the law clerks they can you know see you know the participants and the council very clearly. And and there are two uh, functions buttons. One is uh, about, you know, you can upload the electronic uh, experts um, into the online system so that you can present evidence simultaneously while the hearing is ongoing. And the other button you click on it, you basically can see the transcripts uh, just updated uh, simultaneously. And you like to, at the end of the hearing, you may want to download the transcripts and there would pop up some, uh, 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 I think, uh, uh, ask you to, you know, um, do some uh, signature. You basically, you know, sign the signature on that, you know, transcripts. So this system works very well. Yeah. So this transcript is that is that auto created? It's it's created by generated by the system. There's not a, a human person that is there typing this transcript while you are speaking. Well, there, there is a two, two ways. Um, uh, one is, you know, some very advanced technologies. When you speak, and even very you speak very softly, and the voices would be converted into the transcripts. So you can see, you know, what you just see would be simultaneously reflected on the screen. So you want to make sure when you do not want to speak, you need to, you know, just uh, shut down the um, mi micro microphone. And, and, and there are other, other types is, you know, you, um, you know, speak, and there is still law clerk sitting in the courtroom, and the uh, the stenographer and the law, uh, law clerk can type in what you're gonna say, and convert into the Word or PDF format transcripts. There are two types of services, depending on the how advanced uh, the technology the, is adopted. That, that, that's that's pretty amazing. And do you see that now? Is that going to become the mainstay for for litigation in China? Do you see that? instead of going to court now, that, that you might be using more and more of this virtual hearings, even without the COVID-19 restrictions? Yeah, I can see this is a trend. 
uh, particularly for those small claims disputes, uh, where the facts are very straightforward, the number of documentary evidence is limited, and the judge really want to promote efficiency of the case management. So in that uh, you know, a scenario, I think adoption of the virtual hearing would reflect the future. Um, but there are some, you know, a number of the complex commercial disputes which involve, you know, more documents and the and all more, you know, the more uh, lengthy um, the factual export finding process. In, in that case, the judges still, you know, focus on the interactions of the participant and their counsel. So, um, so it, to for for that type of complex case, it would take some time to adopt the uh, virtual hearing. And what about the situation for arbitration in China? Is that, you mentioned as well that the major arbitration centers in China were also adopting virtual hearings. Do you see that becoming the trend also in China for arbitration, that instead of having physical meetings, so after all, China is a huge country uh, and you may have council and parties from different provinces. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of, of everyone meeting in one location, do you see that it will save time and cost for arbitration in China, that you, virtual hearings become more, used more, becomes more of the norm? Yeah, I think so, uh, Stephen, definitely. Uh, for the arbitration proceedings, um, I think the adoption of the virtual hearing would be future. Uh, the reasons is like this. Uh, number one, it, the Chinese arbitration proceeding adopts the civil law traditions. That means, uh, you know, no or less, you know, when the statements would be submitted to the arbitration in China. And so that would not require, you know, uh, too much or testimony uh, before the tribunal. And in general situation, uh, in Chinese arbitration proceeding, there would be no cross-examination. So in, in, the, in that case, you know, it, it's not very necessary to, you know, have all the witness to, you know, uh, appear before the tribunal. The, in most occasions, it's just the, you know, uh, parties or one or two, you know, uh, factual witnesses who would like to, you know, appear before the tribunal with, with the company of the counsel that would, would surface. So th this is one, one advantage for the Chinese arbitration to adopt the virtual hearing. The other still about the number of the documentary evidence compared to those uh, presented during the uh, international arbitration proceeding is relatively limited. So in, in that case, you know, and also uh, the length of the hearing date in China uh, is a uh, one day as euro and compared to, you know, uh, one week or two weeks hearing in international commercial arbitration overseas. So in, in counting all these factors, um, I think it's quite sensible for Chinese arbitration community to adopt the virtual hearing, you know, in the future. And I can see that would be increasing trend for doing so. Tell me something about your, your uh, Kentong litigation uh, circle. I think it's a WeChat uh, account that you have. Uh, I, yeah. I've heard you, you mentioned that you, you're, you have between 400,000 to 500,000 subscribers, mm -hmm. which is a number which uh, obviously uh, astounding for many of us outside of China, but of course in China, uh, numbers are relative and, and that probably is is something that you're more used to in, in terms of seeing numbers of that. But tell me about, about that. When, when did that start and, 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 and what, what do you uh, do and achieve on the Tentong litigation circle? The seven years ago, uh, Tentong created a web chat account and through which we publish the law articles and the study reports every day. And this kind of publication invoked the thoughts among the Chinese legal community and uh, more and more uh, legal practitioners follow this wet chat account and the updates of the wet chat account. So today we have um, almost 500,000 people you know, follow this attention litigation circle. Many of them are you know, lawyers, just like uh, you and me, and some of them are judges, some are you know, the, the in-house counsel, and some of them are business leaders. And uh, it, because of the, you know, the in, in effect of this, uh, the influence we have cast out through this, uh, you know, online publication, and more and more people, um, you know, send their publications uh, to us, and we are, you know, circulated to the public. I assume on this uh, function, then 
when you, you your lawyers post the, your articles, I assume the people who read them can comment on it. So you have a discussion that that's going on uh, on, on on this on on this platform. Uh, is that how it works? Yeah, it, it, it can work as because we uh, you know put our web chat and you know, a code uh, in the article. So if the uh, reader, any reader, find this article very interesting, they're gonna scan the code and get connected to the, uh, you know, the Canton lawyers. And then we can become friends of each other. And we may discuss about this article. We may discuss about the, you know, the business development. We may discuss about other interesting topics related to law and business. So this is kind of not only a, a knowledge sharing platform, but also a very effective business development tool. That's, that, that's very interesting. That's fantastic. And I know how WeChat is, is, the, fun, is the platform which almost everybody communicates now uh, in China. I know that instead of uh, giving out business cards to each other, you just uh, add each other on WeChat. And, and that's the preferred method of, 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 of keeping somebody con somebody's contact. Uh, 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 let me move on to something which I do want to ask you about because it's something which, which, I, which I do personally, you know, which is international arbitration. And a lot of my cases these days, I would say over 90% of my cases these days have two Asian parties involved in Asian subject matter. And, and in some of these, they are uh, Chinese parties. And a trend I've been seeing is Chinese law firms now representing these Chinese parties. This would be arbitration, international arbitration seated outside of China, uh, it, usually under a governing law that is not Chinese law. Uh, I've seen Singapore law and, 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 other, and, and other usually common law, law-based systems. Uh, and these Chinese lawyers are arguing this, these cases themselves and the language of, of arbitration is English. Uh, it's, it's, a, it, it's a phenomenon which, which I'm very interested in, which I encourage. I think I want to see more Chinese firms and more Chinese lawyers arguing these cases themselves. And I wanted to ask you about your experience with international arbitration. I know you have a focus on international arbitration. What's your experience with international arbitration uh, conducted in English? I see in my experience like this. If the governing law of the contract is Chinese law, um, the Chinese lawyers would have a role in participating in international commercial arbitration because uh, the clients think, you know, this is the, the Chinese law governed contract and it would might it be better if we have Chinese, Chinese lawyers involved represent, representing them in international commercial arbitration proceedings. And the second factor uh, really you know, affecting the, our involved international commercial arbitration is if the, the language of the international arbitration is either Mandarin Chinese or bilingual, that means Chinese and English, and in most occasions, uh, the Chinese lawyers would also be you know, uh, engaged by the clients to participate in the uh, international commercial arbitration. Um, th this is two you know, important factors which really affect the frequency of the China Chinese lawyers participating in international commercial arbitration. And in recent days, I, I have been representing a, a, a Chinese client in international arbitration institution um, arbitration. Um, basically, I see you know, our involvement in this case is because the first, the governing law of the contract is related to Chinese law. Uh, even the language of the arbitration is English. The seat of the arbitration is within the China. And so I see, you know, the, uh, our involvement in this kind of cases it becomes important because we have a say about the Chinese law and the seat of arbitration is within China. That means uh, the supervisory court uh, will be Chinese court. So uh, that, that's give a reasons for you know, Chinese lawyers to participate in this kind of international arbitration cases. And interestingly, my opposing counsel uh, who represent uh, the respondent, which is a European entity, is also a PRC counsel. And I think it also, you know, this, you know, the governing law issue and the seat of arbitration uh, issue also give my opposing counsel a, a position to represent a foreign client in this kind of case. I've got a, a question. I wonder whether it, it, it makes a difference. Right? Uh, so you've got this experience. I think in that case, you the language of the arbitration was English. Uh, do you think, and obviously you must have done many, many arbitrations where the language of the arbitration is, is Mandarin or, or maybe even bilingual arbitrations. Do you think that the procedure you adopt is different 
if the language of the arbitration is different? Do you think that if you have arbitration in English, you might tend to adopt certain procedures, and if you have arbitration in Mandarin, you might adopt certain procedures? Is uh, is is that have you seen have you seen that it makes a difference what language you use? And not a too much difference if the owning factor is language. Uh, I think it really depends on the composition of the tribunal and the, uh, particularly the chairperson's preference uh, about the procedures. So, uh, you know, for CTEC English proceeding, once I worked at four, you know, the uh, majority of the tribunal come from the common law jurisdictions. And you can find you know, the chairperson is inclined to you know, adopt a common law oriented approach. In, in that scenario, uh, the, the uh, language of the opportunity proceeding is bilingual. So this, we still follow uh, the, the common law approach. Uh, that means uh, document production, the factual witness statements, and uh, factual uh, witness would be subject to cross-examination. And for um, a Hong Kong city arbitration, um, we see in a majority of the tribunal uh, basically, the chairperson comes from a European civil law jurisdiction, and uh, he preferred to adopt a truncate, uh, you know, and a more efficient arbitration proceeding. That means less docs production and uh, um, a limited number of the factual witness statement and more efficient uh, arbitration hearings. So uh, th th that really depends on the preference of the, of the tribunal. Right. Thank you very much for that, David. Uh, thank you very, very much for, for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure to speak to you. It's been a real pleasure to see your office again, even though only in the background. And uh, I look forward to the opportunity when I can visit you again physically. I'm not sure whether that will be, but I'm sure it will arrive again. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you again. Okay. Bye-bye.